Now, I love Easter, right? And you got to admit a little bit, at least as a pastor, I do. Easter is a little bit of an odd thing because when I'm figuring out what it is I'm going to preach, when I'm figuring out what it is I'm going to talk about this morning, you come kind of knowing, right, what it is I'm going to be talking about. Any surprise to anybody, right? And, and, and for people who only ever go to church at Christmas and Easter, they're really going, yeah, that's like the only sermon I ever hear, right? And you kind of get tired of hearing the same sermon over and over again. But it's okay. I do a good job with those two sermons, I think. And so hopefully you'll at least not tune me out today. But, but I love Easter. I really do. Easter is Easter's my favorite holiday. I love Easter well beyond Christmas, well beyond any of the other holidays. Easter is my favorite. I love it. And so um, it's the perfect time, I guess, for anybody who's ever thought of putting their faith in Jesus Christ to become one of his followers, to kind of take that final step. And that's, of course, what we are going to be talking about a little bit today. Now, a few years ago, I was doing some reading, and I came across this interesting story, and it will show a little bit of my age because it was a Dear Abby story. Um, I was reading this Dear Abby story, right? And this Dear Abby story was in response to someone's question. You see, there, there was a, a young man from a, a very wealthy family who was about to graduate from high school. And it was the custom in this very affluent neighborhood that he grew up in for the parents to give a graduating student a car, a brand new car, in fact, for their graduation present. Man, I wish I grew up in that neighborhood, right? I drove a 75 Impala, and it wasn't in 1975, okay? Come on now, right? And so, so it was the custom in this neighborhood. You'd, you'd get... The, pretty much the car of your choice because it was that affluent of a neighborhood. And so Bill and his father, Bill was the student, Bill and his father had spent months researching and looking at cars and going to dealerships and test driving and figuring out just exactly the make, the model, the color, the options, everything, everything that Bill wanted in his car, right? Now on the very eve of his graduation, his father came into his room and he, he handed him a Bible that was gift wrapped and and uh, Bill, shortly after his father had left the room, unwrapped this gift and opened it and saw it was a Bible and just in anger threw the Bible down, was just so livid at his father, just couldn't believe that his father would just come and, and, and only give him a Bible. So, so Bill grabbed some of his stuff and he stormed out of the house never to see his father again. You see, he and his father never saw the, one another again because Bill left and, and stayed with some relatives for a while, went on to college, and, and shortly thereafter, Bill's father passed away unexpectedly. Now, when news of his father's death had reached him, he, he went home again, and as he was sitting there going through his father's possessions and looking at all the stuff that he was due to inherit, he came across that, that Bible that his father had given him that night before graduation, kind of brushed the dust off of it, the story says, and started thumbing through it. And here, right in the middle of the Bible, he found a cashier's check for the exact amount of the car that he had wanted. The very car they had chosen together. Now, as I thought about that story, I couldn't help but wonder how many people in this world have done the very same thing to God, literally tossing aside a wonderful promise because they didn't understand it. They didn't know what it contained. They didn't believe it was possible. You see, in our world, we, we're taught that if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is, right? And so many of us have been taken in by these sorts of empty promises along the way in our lives that we become gunshy, we become leery of anyone or anything that tells us we can have something for nothing, right? Can we have something for nothing? I mean, the world simply doesn't work that way, does it? But you know what? God does. See, God never made a promise that was too good to be true. The truth of the matter is that the world is indeed full of empty promises. We watch TV, right? The advertisements tell us 
do this, buy that, and you can be happy, you can be skinny, you can be sexy, you can be rich, you can be famous, right? I'm apparently not buying the right products. <laughs> but if you buy these things or you do these things or, or whatever it is, right, you're going to get what you want. But it doesn't take all that long before we realize if we've tried those things that those promises don't live up. I mean, how many years have I been doing seven-minute abs and I haven't found one yet? Right? Empty promises. But you see, God is different. Instead of promises of emptiness on Easter, you see, he gave us emptiness that is full of promise. And this morning, I would like us to think about the promises of Easter. In fact, there are three empty promises of Easter. Each promise is marked by something empty. An empty cross, an empty tomb, and empty burial clothes. And it's the very fact that, that these things that are empty assure us that God's promises are indeed real. Because they couldn't hold Jesus. Because he couldn't be contained by the cross. He couldn't be contained by the tomb. He couldn't be contained by his burial clothes. And because of that, we too can be sure of the fullness of God's promises in our lives. Let's begin with the empty cross first. You see, because the cross was empty, we have the promise that our sin can be forgiven. I mean, uh, let's go back. If you want to follow along today, we're going to be in the book of Luke. Um, I'm going to be in Luke 24, 1 through 12. We have some pew Bibles. Uh, if you have an iPhone, Android, whatever, iPad, feel free to open that up. That, that'll work. Uh, Luke 24 is where I'm going to be at, telling the story from that passage. And if you don't have a Bible, by the way, as you exit on the Welcome Center, we have a Bible for you. There's a blue Bible there. Feel free to grab one and take it home with you. If the three of them that are sitting there disappear, I have another 40 or so of them in my office. Let me know. I would love to to give you a Bible to take home with you today. It's uh, not the greatest Bible. I mean, it's a good Bible. It's God's Word, but it's a paperback Bible. But hey, it's better than nothing, and it's free, right? Sometimes things are free. No strings attached. But back to what we're saying here. Back to what I'm talking about. Because the cross was empty, we have the promise of forgiven sin. Now back to that, what I was saying early on that very early first Easter morning, right? Early in the morning just before dawn or just as dawn was about to happen, but the sun hasn't quite risen yet. A few of the followers of Jesus, you see, uh, the women, they are on their way to the tomb where Jesus was buried. They have been walking now for maybe a half hour from where they had spent the night. And they know that the task that has been set before them is indeed a, a sad task. Because you see, they, they are going to this grave to anoint Jesus' body with oil. And as they come up to kind of a, a rise in the hill on their path, they, they pause uh, somewhat motionless and quiet, staring off into the distance, right? And if you look off with them, you see just outside the city of Jerusalem, a gruesome reminder of the events of just a few few days ago. Do you see it? Silhouetted over there just before the sun is coming up. Three crosses. The pink sky behind them. A hill the locals call Golgotha, or the skull. There are three crosses. You see, yesterday was the Sabbath, so nobody has yet removed those three crosses. So there they stand as an empty reminder of the horror that occurred on Friday. And that one in the middle, if you were able to see it closely, that's the one that Jesus hung on. And if you took a close look, you'd see at the top where that crown of thorns had been on his head. You'd see some of his blood there. You'd see the stains on the crossbar where he was nailed. You'd see the spot where the nail went through his feet on that center post. 
might even see some of the, the mess that would have spilled out of the side of him as one of the Roman soldiers came with a spear and thrust it up beneath his ribs and into his body cavity. He certainly would have seen where his back would have gone against that wood. You see, he had been beaten by a cat of nine tails, a, a horrible, horrible thing. So there they see the reminder of Jesus' death. You see, Jesus really did die. And that's why I want you to see the cross vividly this morning. Because the cross is the place where he died. But today, the cross is empty. It's empty of Jesus' body, but it's full of God's promises. Full of hope for you and for me full of hope because the empty cross stands and tells us that we can be forgiven. Because it was on that very cross that Jesus paid the penalties for our sins. You know, sin, right? Sin. There's a word that's just not quite politically correct anymore, right? Our language is changing and sometimes there's words we don't like to use anymore, things we don't necessarily like to talk about all that much and it's not real popular to talk about sin, right? When was the last time you had coffee with a friend and said, let's talk about sin? Mm, I'm a pastor and that doesn't happen much. But the simple fact of the matter is, we're all sinners. You're a sinner. The person next to you is a sinner. You know that pretty well, right? The person sitting in front of you is a sinner. Behind you is a sinner. The person talking to you is a sinner. We have all fallen short of the glory of God because we have sinned. And the only person who has ever lived a sinless life was Jesus Christ himself. Everyone else has failed. So, so here's the problem with that. According to God's law in, in the Bible, it says the wages of sin are death. He says that a soul must surely die. Because we have sinned, we, we deserve God's just punishment. We deserve eternal death. We deserve hell. However, when you look at the empty cross, it stands as a reminder of God's promise that we can be forgiven. On that cross, Jesus paid the penalty for yours and my sins. And God tells us that, that God demonstrated his own love for us and towards us that while we were yet sinners, that Christ died for us. You see, Christ, a couple thousand years ago, died for my sins today. He knew I was going to need it. And it was on that cross that Jesus Christ offered his perfect, sinless life on behalf of each and every one of us. And no one else, not, not Moses in the Old Testament, not Abraham, not David, not Isaiah, not even Muhammad or Buddha for that matter, no one else has ever lived perfectly and then went and offered their very life for our salvation. And that is exactly why the Bible says, there is no other name given under heaven by which we might be saved. When Jesus died and he breathed his last breath, he cried out to tell us die. You'll see it on my office door. And that means it is finished. The penalty was paid. On that cross, on that empty cross, it was there that his blood was spilt for our salvation. Before that fateful Friday, God could open the books and look at my name and look at your name and look at all of our names and see a record of our sin. Guilty of sin, it would say, behind my name. But when Jesus went to the cross, God literally transferred our accounts to his name. And on that day, across the name of everyone who calls on Jesus as Lord and Savior, he wrote, forgiven, forgiven, forgiven. Because of the work that Jesus did on the cross, you and I now stand or can stand forgiven. 
That is the first empty promise of Easter, the empty cross, filled with the promise of forgiven sin. Let's get back to our ladies in the story here. After the ladies paused briefly, seeing those crosses, they continue along on their way, on their path towards the tomb. And as they're going, one of them wonders aloud and says, when we get there, who's going to move the stone for us? You see, they had good reason to be concerned. The stone that was placed in front of the tomb was, was a large boulder of sorts, probably weighing hundreds, if not thousands of pounds. And not only that, uh, the Romans had gone and sealed that very tomb, so no one was allowed to move it without their permission. Yet the ladies faithfully continue to trek on. And as they're walking, suddenly they they feel the earth begin to move. And frightened, they look at one another. Earthquake or what's going on or what's happening? Not certain what to do. And after a few minutes of that quaking, they seem to settle down. Things return to normal. They thought it strange, but they continued on their way. And as they approached the burial site, they're still wondering what had just happened. Who's going to open the door? when they see something remarkable. You see, when they get to the tomb, here lies on the ground, unconscious, the soldiers, Roman soldiers, who should have been standing guard. And not only are these soldiers lying there unconscious, but the stone in front of the tomb has been rolled away. And, and there inside they see there, there's an angel glowing like the sun sitting there in front of this entrance on top of the rock. Now listen to the words of that angel that day. He says, do not be afraid. That's often the first words you hear if you ever see an angel. He says, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He is not here. He is risen. Jesus had risen. He was alive. The tomb was empty. And what tremendous promise That holds for us. In the empty tomb is the truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The promise that every one of us who put our trust in him will be raised to eternal life. To those who know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, death has lost its sting, as we sang earlier. It no longer is something to be feared. What fear is there when we have the promise that one day we will forever be in heaven with him? There was a, a father and son. They were driving down a country road one day. The father's old truck, they had the windows down. And suddenly a, a bee flies into this window. And you see the problem with that is this young child who's riding in the front seat with his father, back in the days when that was still allowable, was definitely allergic to the bee sting. And so the bee flies in the window and starts buzzing around the cab of that truck and the child begins to panic knowing that if he gets stung, he might die. And so he's panicking and he's freaking out. Seeing the horror on his child's face, the father reached out and grabbed that bee out of the air in his hand. Soon, he opened his hand again and that bee started to buzz a little bit and the boy began to panic again and his son he said son relax I've already taken the sting look the bee can't hurt you anymore see the the empty tomb is God's way of saying relax child I've took the sting death can't hurt you any longer Why was the tomb empty? Because Jesus was alive. The angel said, he is risen. And the the promise to us is that we too can live, even if we might die. That is the second promise of Easter. But it doesn't just end there. There is one more promise that I want you to know about this Easter. And it's the empty promise of the burial clothes. So back to our story with the ladies. See, after, after the angel had spoken to the women, 
they immediately go back and, and, and report to the apostles what they had just experienced, what they had just seen, what had just happened. And with this incredible news, Peter and John immediately jump up and they go racing off to the tomb to see for themselves, right? And when they get there, John stops at the outside. But Peter, you know, he's Peter, being Peter, runs right on in. Right on into the tomb. Peter gets in there. He's looking around. There's no body. And it doesn't take them long to realize what the women had said was exactly as they had said. Peter found the clothes that Jesus had been buried in. And they too were empty as the tomb. And this could only mean one thing. Jesus is alive. If somebody had stolen the body, right, they wouldn't have removed his clothes. They wouldn't have folded them up neatly and nicely and left them laying here. Truly, Jesus had resurrected. And it wouldn't be long before Jesus himself would then reappear to people like Mary Magdalene, then to all the apostles, and eventually to over 500 people in the area of Jerusalem. You see, Jesus would go on to sit down and and eat with people and walk with people, talk with them and be with them, and once again was able to be in fellowship and relationship with people. And you see, that is the promise of the empty burial clothes. Jesus is alive and wants to have a relationship with us. Jesus isn't some distant force out in the universe influencing people. He is a living Savior, and he desires to have a personal relationship with each and every one of us just as he did with his disciples 2,000 years ago. Think about that. The cross couldn't hold him. The tomb couldn't contain him. The burial clothes were unnecessary because Jesus is alive. And I want to ask you an important question this morning. Do you know Jesus? Do you truly know Jesus Christ? You see... We can know something about someone, right? But not truly know them. Like, I know about Bill Clinton. I know about Tiger Woods. I know about Michael Jordan, right? I know about George Bush. But do I really know them? I don't. These are people we can know something about, but do any of us really know them? I suspect not. But you can absolutely know Jesus Christ. You can know his love. You can know his care. You can know his healing. You can know his forgiveness. Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. It's been nearly 2,000 years since Jesus was crucified, buried, and then resurrected. That first Easter Sunday, as those women went to the grave, they had no idea what was about to happen to them. They were not yet aware of all the wonderful promises of that day. See, they saw off in a distance empty crosses. They didn't know those were the promises that their sins would be forgiven. At the end of the journey, they found an empty tomb. They didn't know that would be the promise of eternal life. Inside of the tomb were these empty burial clothes. And they did not yet know that that was the promise that they would once again have a close and personal relationship with the living Jesus Christ, their loving Savior. The promises that they discovered that day, you too can have. You can know the promises of eternal life in heaven. You too can know Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. I'll wrap it up with this story. Many of you will know this man by name, uh, the author John Maxwell. Uh, great, great books on leadership. In one of his books, he tells this story about a blazer, a coat, a, a sport coat blazer that he had purchased once upon a time from Nordstrom's. And he says in the story, he says, about a year and a half ago, I bought this new blazer from Nordstrom's. It was one of those cases, you know, that you might have gone through. You needed a jacket, but you didn't know which one. And you just kind of went in. And as men, we begrudgingly just go pick something off the shelf and go home with it, right? That's how we shop, most of us. And so he did the same as most of his men went in and just, it kind of fit. He bought it and off he went. 
But after he got home, he was like, you know, my blazer wasn't really the right color. To make matters worse, this stupid blazer attracted lint like nothing I've ever owned. And he said, but I bought it, so I wore it. And he said, for the next six months, I kind of wore it with some pretty good regularity. And so he says, after about six months, I just got tired of the stupid, ugly thing kind of hung it towards the back of my closet. He said, I own a bunch of different jackets, and why did I keep wearing this stupid one, right? So I tucked it away in the back of my mind, but he said, then that spring I was doing some cleaning and getting rid of some clothes that didn't fit, and there was that jacket again. He said, I remember, I remember hearing about this amazing return policy that Nordstrom's had, basically an unconditional return policy. He thought, you know, I've had this thing for now like a year and a half, I've worn it a bunch of times. Is there any way they would ever take this thing back? And he says, well, I decided, what do I got to lose? I pulled that old blazer out, threw a little extra lint on it just to make it look extra bad. Right? Took it in to Nordstrom's men's department. He says, as I walked in, I felt a little nervous, right? I'd, I'd walked up to the, the counter in the men's area there, prepared my speech in my mind and I said to him, I am about to put your famous unconditional return policy to its ultimate test. Laid down the blazer. Said, I've worn this a bunch of times. I've had it for like a year and a half. I don't even know where the receipt is and frankly, I don't like it. It's the wrong color. It attracts lint like it's going out of style. It doesn't even fit me quite right. But I want to return this blazer, and I want to get a different one. And then I just stood there, he says. And he says, I couldn't believe it. He says, this guy across the counter from me with a big handlebar mustache looked at me and just shook his head. And he said, for heaven's sake, what took you so long? Let's go find you a blazer. He said, 10 minutes later, I walked out of that door with a new blazer. Not only a new blazer, one that cost $75 more than the one I had originally paid for, but they didn't charge me a penny. He was astounded, astonished. He said, it was perfect for me and didn't cost me a cent. In a small way, the Nordstrom's department store is a whole, lot, a whole lot like God. They are willing to back up their promise. And I think at Easter, more than any time of the year, we realize that God has made all sorts of what sounds like outlandish promises, right? So outlandish that some of us struggle to actually believe they can be true. But can we? This morning we have heard about three promises that God has made to us. The promise of forgiven sins, the promise of eternal life, and the promise of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. My question to you this morning is, will you take God at his word? If so, listen to this very final promise. It's found in Romans 10, 13. There it says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That is beautiful. This morning, if you have never accepted God's promises for your life, He is waiting, probably wondering, for heaven's sake, what took you so long? Don't wait another day. Do it today. And know the joy of eternal life in Jesus Christ. I trust that the Lord will truly bless each and every one of you this Easter. Let's pray.